good afternoon. It's always a challenge to have people moving up after the lunch. So let's begin the session. Basically, because we have a, a very tight schedule, because we have to finish uh, this session at 3.20 sharp. Because at 3.20, it will be a video conference with uh, Mike Porter. So it will be Boston uh, with the video conference. Uh, Agree that the conversation with, uh, with uh, Christian Kettles just at this field. Uh, well, this is a very important plenary session. I would say, without any hesitance, that this is the core of the conference. Uh, in this conference, we will address the issue of how territories should address current competitive. Uh, it will be a session in which uh, we will reflect, reflect about learning and about, and about practice. We will talk about good practices. Probably we will talk about some bad practices. But you know that it's much more difficult to talk about bad practices, although I would say that we learn much more from bad practices than from good practices. Uh, in any case, we will talk about lessons learned. And it's important to talk about lessons because generally when people discuss cases, situations, people, they show us a question, well, how can we transplant this case, this model to another place? These days in which lots of you have been discussing on many issues and one of the topics that has been addressed has been the last model of competitiveness, People, and especially people in the press and so on and so forth, have been asking, well, is it possible to transplant the bus model to other places? And I would say always that it's impossible to transplant models. But we can transplant lessons, reflections, failures, and uh, all these type of things. There is not a transferable model. In the first part of the conference, we will have two very important speakers. On the one hand, we'll have, we are very fortunate to have Janamita Devan. Janamita Devan is by the Vice President of the private sector at the World Bank. He is a national from Singapore, although I think he's also a national from the United States of America. He joined the bank in October 2009, and before he had a very uh, wide and successful practice McKinsey. Um, thank you very much for being with us here. I know that you have a very tight schedule, so we are happy to have you here and having you addressing our colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Fellow panelists, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to join you this afternoon. And the issues I think that we are exploring at this conference, constructing, enduring, and sustainable competitiveness mm -hmm. could scarcely be more critical to development and to the entire international economic agenda, but especially to the low-income countries that the World Bank Group has committed significant resources to helping, but equally important to the middle-income and advanced economies. I'm struck by the very active verb that you've chosen for the title of this discussion, constructing competitiveness. <clears throat> Indeed, strengthening competitiveness calls for an active process with determined policy interventions that can help spur job growth. Wherever I travel in developing countries, as well as developed countries, I hear that the number one economic priority is job 
creation. Both business leaders and government officials are searching for ways to get the conditions and policies right to allow for job creation that is sustainable for the long term. Another critical part of the policy agenda must be to analyze, promote, and accelerate innovation, which is a key component to competitiveness. And these steps must always be pursued in their local context, tailoring our strategies and policy interventions to fit each country's or each region's particular economic conditions, geography, and local natural resource endowments. Clearly, play a role in determining a country's potential vision in the global value chain, and thus its potential to build on its comparative advantage. The bank has embraced these challenges. In just the past couple of years, we have set up our efforts on what we call competitive industries and innovation. And in my brief remarks today, I'll focus on three of the factors that we in the World Bank believe are essential to achieving the ambitious agenda to promote competitiveness, growth, and job creation. First, the necessity of addressing what I call the missing middle. Second, keeping our eye on the ball. Bear with me for the moment for being cryptic. And third, the importance of ensuring strong governance and implementation. My first major point is this. We need to intensify our focus on the importance of the middle level of the economy, the industry level, where the private sector sits. I include in this definition manufacturing, agribusiness, and the services industries. In years past, the development community has tended to overlook this middle level, including the World Bank. For example, for many years, the World Bank dwelt primarily on the big challenges on the macroeconomic side, through our work on the investment climate dimension, health, education, uh, through our doing business indicators on the conditions for conducting business. And we also dwell on the micro side, focusing on firm by firm investments through our International Finance Corporation, or IFC. Now, mind you, these macro and micro factors are important and necessary. But we have now come to recognize, however, that it's a serious error to overlook the vital role that the middle level, the industry level, plays in development. Adding that would not only be necessary, but sufficient for our development agenda. Why? because this is a level where wealth is actually created. It is at this level that the economy can be most energetic, innovative, and inclusive. And we, we should recall that this middle level includes not only the large firms in specific industries, but also the job creation engine of every economy, the sector of small and medium-sized enterprises, the so-called SMEs, or in many of our clients, countries, it would also include the micro enterprises. If competitiveness strategies are well designed, attacking the job creation problem at this industry level can yield large gains very quickly. The World Bank Group has recently intensified our focus on the key factors that are critical to this process, promoting industry's competitiveness, strengthening economies, capacity for innovation, encouraging entrepreneurship, and incubating new technologies so, they, so that they can come to market. These priorities are indispensable for success in a global economy that demands both the rigor and the flexibility 
Government has a constructive role to play in pursuing these goals. Governments can invest in targeted R&D, technologies, education and health care. And when the private sector is unwilling or unable to invest because, for example, the market is still too risky, governments can step in and accelerate the process. That brings me to my second major point, keeping our eyes or our eyes on the ball. What do I mean by that? We must promote conditions that allow for and encourage continuous innovation and adaptation. And the operative word here is continuous. Various factors contribute to creating the conditions that are conducive to the ideal of innovation and adaptation. At the micro level, such factors include good monetary and fiscal policy, a national infrastructure that puts a premium on efficiency, a responsive education system, an effective health care delivery system, and so on and so forth. Similarly, at the industry level, I contend there are five key areas that we need to keep our eyes on the ball. Number one, keeping an eye on the ball for creating an investment climate that is conducive and receptive to the needs of the specific industry or industries in which a country has a comparative advantage. Number two, keeping an eye on the ball for promoting workforce skills that are well matched with the needs of those specific industries. Number three, keeping an eye on the ball on access to finance, especially serving the needs of the micro enterprises and SMEs within a specific industrial uh, ecology. Some SMEs, for example, need help with their basic need um, for working capital. Others may need capital intensive financing. Still others may just need solid how-to advice on getting their basic financial infrastructure in place. Number four, keeping an eye on the ball for a strong infrastructure matched to the needs of the players in the local industrial ecosystem. And number five, keeping an eye on the ball on innovation a mix of product technologies and processes that are adapted to local needs but that are competitive in the international market. Moreover, it's important to state that just getting an industry ecology organized is not enough. It is not something you do every now and then. Continuous adaptation and change is the prerequisite, I believe, for success. Thus, my emphasis on keeping our eyes on the ball, on the five factors I enumerated. And that could be many more, depending on the context of the country or place we are working in. To suggest some examples of this constant re-evaluation and repositioning, is an industry, say shoes or apparel, investing to make sure its designs are moving with the times? When should an industry in technology, for instance, upgrade its systems and thus make obsolete its current products, reinventing itself through the process of creative destruction? Are an industry skills, for example, in food processing, adapting to ever higher levels of technology? If industry leaders are not continually asking these kinds of questions, it will only be a matter of time before their competitors in that industry will pass them by. Or worse, at the economy-wide level, if industries fail to adapt, or if public policy fails to adapt, an entire country's economy can quickly shift gears, going from a virtuous cycle of growth, higher incomes and prosperity, into a vicious cycle of contraction, lower income and poverty. Innovation, therefore, is critical in improving competitiveness. And the empirical evidence is that, on average, worldwide, half of a country's long-term growth is due to innovation and technology enhancement. 
our client countries increasingly recognize this reality. To offer one example from here in Europe, I recently met with the President of uh, Bulgaria, last week, uh, in fact, just earlier this year, to discuss a comprehensive innovation and competitiveness study, which the World Bank presented at a practitioners forum in Sofia. The bank group is now helping the government of Bulgaria rethink its innovation strategy and core supporting instruments, helping create the capabilities to monitor and evaluate impact. To offer another European example, a very promising innovation program is now getting underway in the Western Balkans. With the World Bank's help, seven countries are coming together to explore sharing R&D capability and university research facilities in a cross-border effort to make the most of regional synergies. This brings me to my third major point, the importance of strong implementation and the critical factor of sound governance. The question is no longer about the why or the whether of getting the process right, but about the how. How to implement targeted strategic intervention that succeed in the context of local economic and social conditions. Effective collaboration between the public and private sectors can unlock an economy's innovation potential. But sometimes, and we know this from 65 years of experience, such collaborations can go wrong and benefits can find their way into the wrong hands. Getting the governance process right is thus absolutely essential. There's no point embarking on a missing middle strategy if it is rife with corruption, or if weak governance allows for regulatory capture by the most powerful. If a missing middle strategy does not address the need of the small players, there will be unequal growth. And at the end of the day, that spells trouble. There must be strict safeguards against all forms of capture, corruption, and cronyism. Having those safeguards helps each individual project succeed and helps our client's overall strategy succeed and helps the entire development process succeed. Clearly, this is a challenging agenda. It's an agenda that we face on a daily basis um, at the World Bank, and I'm sure in, in other development uh, agencies. It will require all our ingenuity and our resolve to keep development moving forward steadily by driving these three priorities, and I repeat. First, addressing the missing level by designing effective industry-level strategies Second, paying attention to the five keep an eye on the ball factors that I mentioned to stay at the cutting edge. And third, ensuring strong governance and effective implementation. Now the challenge may certainly be daunting, yet I feel certain that by marshalling all our resources through cooperative efforts among business leaders, government policy makers and development partners, we can offer our client countries the hope of building a more resilient economy. The World Bank and the IFC, which I represent, remain committed to working with our partners to promote stronger competitiveness and more imaginative innovation in our client countries, while advancing the ideals of inclusion and social cohesion, and thus fulfilling our vision of broadly shared prosperity and a world free of poverty. I'm sure that many of you may be surprised at what I'm saying, because the bank, in fact, in the past, had not been associated with pushing for an agenda at the industry level. Um, things have changed, and I think that the bank group has come along now to being part of the partnership that we want to foster to do a lot more, especially in our uh, 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 low-income countries, but I think it's equally applicable to the middle-income countries and the advanced countries that we are looking at now as well.
So thank you very much, and congratulations to the organizers of this conference. I think uh, you guys are in, a, in an exciting uh, nexus, and, uh, and I think the opportunities are just there for us to grab on. Thank you. Thank you, Dermitra, for your talk. Thank you for sharing with us all of the reflections that the, the institution has been doing, especially in the last few years, about the challenges of competitiveness in the poor countries. And thank you very much for um, being blunt about the history of the institution that has all the international institutions as a record that is mixed. Uh, myself coming from one of those institutions and very confident of the role of these institutions and I feel the uh, international financial institutions are essential for the development of the developing world. Um, in the, with the same spirit, <clears throat> and I would say that when we organized, when we accepted the organization of the, of the conference for, for me, for the colleagues, for us, especially being in Spain, I would say that is very important, we consider that Latin America is for us a very caring and very important issue. It's a very important uh, continent in which for Spanish enterprises, for Basque enterprises, I think that we have an important role to play. The other day, talking with a colleague, told me something, a reflection that I never had before, but I think that is very Important reflection. He said, well, the situation right now in, between Latin America and Spain is a little bit the same relationship that we had or you had after the Spanish Civil War. There, lots of people had to quit Spain and had to go, many of them, to Latin America. They were intellectuals, many of them, they were professionals, workers, people that have had access to knowledge and technology. And they went to a continent that at that time was also having money like today. And we're on demand for technologies, they were on demand of knowledge, they were on demand of science, they were on demand of an upgrade of, of an upgrading of talent. And I would say that the Spanish Republicans played an excellent role in Latin America. So one of the issues related to that is the role that the Inter-American Development Bank, that used to be my home for many years, which I developed a very important part of my, of my career. So that is why I invited uh, people from the American Development Bank to share with us the ideas that the American Development Bank had about competitiveness. So today is Flora Montalegre painting with us. She is a citizen from Costa Rica. She is working in the American Development Bank just in the year in which I left. So we didn't know each other before. And she is the uh, division chief for competitiveness and innovation. So thank you very much for being with us and the floor is yours.
Uh, just as a, as a point of departure, um, I assume many of you know that uh, the Inter-American Development Bank is a multilateral development bank. We have 26 borrowing member countries. And uh, what we see in terms of competitiveness is a very diverse region. It is not uh, easy to have recipes uh, for, for the countries of our region because there's a great deal of heterogeneity, both among the countries as well as within the countries. And I won't go into the details. This is the, the ranking according to the, to the Global Competitiveness Index, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. So all I would like to point out is that uh, most of the countries of Latin America are still in, uh, have a fairly low ranking in terms of uh, competitiveness index. And uh, even the large countries like Brazil, Argentina, uh, are still in the ranking between 51 and 100. Uh, we have uh, several countries uh, like Paraguay, Bolivia, Honduras, Haiti, uh, that are among the lowest ranking countries uh, in the world. Uh, and we do have just very few countries that are among the top 50 and those are Chile, Costa Rica, and, and Panama. So there's a lot of work uh, that we need to do in terms of competitiveness. Uh, one of the things that the, the bank has worked for many years um, on, on issues of, of industrial promotion, uh, industrial restructuring, industrial policies, uh, but it is only recently, at the beginning of this year, that they created uh, the division that I now am able to head, which is the Competitiveness and Innovation Division. And, and I think it's not because we hadn't worked on this. It was because I think the bank wanted to highlight the importance today in, in our global economy to focus much more attention on the issues of competitiveness and innovation in our region. How, how do we work uh, in practice? I mean, how does uh, the competitiveness and innovation uh, division work? Well, it, we basically focus on firms and, and how to increase the productivity of firms, how do we bring innovation uh, to increase productivity, and how do we make these firms more competitive. Uh, and the way uh, that we do it, uh, a lot of our strategy has to do with uh, working with governments. Uh, we are on the, even though the bank has a private sector window, I am on the pub, what we call the public sector window of the bank. And so our role is to work through governments, through public policies, uh, to promote science, technology, and innovation, uh, and industrial promotion uh, and restructuring. And so a lot of our work has to do with policy dialogue with our governments. It has to do with making the case for increased investment in innovation, uh, making the case if we're really creating an environment uh, that promotes uh, competitiveness. And, and it also has to do with uh, generating knowledge and sharing this knowledge uh, with the countries in our region. And it also has to do with investments. And we are a bank, and so we finance uh, investments uh, in technology uh, and innovation. And uh, our focus is, is a systemic focus. We are absolutely convinced uh, that it is not enough uh, to have a, a single project here and a single project there, that we really need to look uh, at uh, a systemic and a long-term uh, process involving public sector, private sector, universities, uh, and research institutes. And, and this is not an easy task uh, in Latin America. In, in my conversations here in the, in the Basque country, one of the things that really it comes, you know, that people bring to our attention is the, the collaboration between the private and the public sectors. And that continues to be a great uh, challenge uh, in Latin America. It is also a challenge to have policies uh, that uh, go for the long term. So we see our role very much as trying to uh, promote uh, and to work with governments so that they have a long term view of how you build uh, innovation uh, and competitiveness uh, systems uh, in the region. Now, where, where is Latin America? And I'll give you just a little bit uh, of information uh, in this regard. In, uh, in terms of uh, investment in R&D as a percent of, of uh, GDP, uh, Latin America ranks really quite, uh, quite low uh, compar compared to 
uh, emerging uh, countries as well as OECD countries. It, we have the OECD average being approximately 2.29% of GDP, and Latin America with only 0.67% of R&D's investment as a percentage of GDP. And, and I think what's even more striking is that the bulk of uh, what little R&D is made is done by the public sector and not by the <laughs> private sector. And in the chart on your right, uh, you can see that it is almost the reverse of what we see in, as, uh, as the average in the OECD, where 64% of investment is private investment. Uh, in Latin America, it is only 37%, uh, and the rest is carried out uh, by the public sector. I think what is even more striking is uh, when we look uh, at the distribution of this uh, investment in R&D and innovation. And I think uh, what we see here is that 60%, uh, almost 60% of what is done uh, in R&D investment is done in Brazil. Um, Mexico, 21%. Argentina, despite its size, only 8%. Uh, Chile, 4%. And the rest of Latin America, you know, which you know, it's, it's more than 20 countries, it, it's, it's really very, very limited, uh, the share that they have in terms of uh, investment and innovation. Um, I need to. I'm going to need to go to the internet on this one. I need to zoom What uh, what I want to show you here uh, is really the gap uh, that has uh, developed uh, when we compare Latin America and Korea. And I think uh, that what is really striking uh, is that uh, at one point in time, uh, Korea and Latin America uh, basically uh, shared more or less the same percentage of investment in R&D, and Latin America actually had almost twice as high, twice as much of the, of the GDP uh, per capita that Korea has. And it's taking a little bit of time to load. Um, It needs to be moved up, sorry. Well, if not, we'll go back to it. But I wanted to show you, uh, we developed this compendium of indicators, and it's got the moving data that really shows you the separation between uh, Korea and Latin America. Basically, we just need to click there. And I think what, uh, what you will see here is as Korea increases investment in R&D, it also it significantly increased uh, its GDP per capita, which is shown by the size of the, of the balls. Uh, and I think uh, it, nowadays what we find is the reverse situation. It, Korea actually has more than twice as much of the GDP per capita that Latin America, Latin America has. And, and that for us is really a, 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 striking, a, a striking difference. Um, and, and another, uh, I think, uh, another striking thing here is, is what limited uh, support, financial support, is still given uh, for innovation in Latin America uh, compared to what we have uh, in the European countries. Uh, how do we work um, at, uh, at my division? And I think uh, we like to use the simile of a, of a, of a sports team. Uh, basically, and what we find is really that uh, to succeed, as we know, a, uh, a football team has to have good players, but they also have to be in the right positions. Uh, and, um, and the productivity, just like that, the productivity of an economy depends on two basic factors, the productivity of the firms, the players, but also how we allocate uh, those available resources, the labor and capital among the firms, that is the positions uh, of the team. Um, and so if we have uh, the wrong players and we have the wrong positions of the players, it, we're going to have productivity levels that are really very low. And so it, much of the work uh, of our division is really uh, 
trying to move uh, those middle players, you know, the missing middle uh, that was talked about in the previous presentation, it closer to the, to the production frontier. And, and we do that by first establishing a level playing field uh, among, the, among the players, uh, but also by promoting uh, active policies to promote entrepreneurship, uh, to address market failures, uh, and to increase the levels of competitiveness uh, of firms. There's a, basically a five uh, main areas that uh, we are currently working on. Uh, and uh, they have to do, first of all, uh, with promoting uh, technology and innovation uh, among firms. Uh, we support firms to increase their investment in innovation and technological development based on research and development as well as new business models. Uh, we support technology diffusion, transfer, and adoption in firms especially in ICTs and green and clean technologies. We support increased firm capabilities in, in design, quality management, and intellectual property. And we also seek to strengthen human capital for innovation and technology absorption. In the areas of entrepreneurship, we're currently quite active in this area. And some of the programs that we have is support incentives for entrepreneurs and dynamic entrepreneurship. Uh, again, especially in ICT and knowledge intensive industries, uh, our programs also promote and develop and seek to develop a culture of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, support networks, incubators, and programs to try to unleash entrepreneurial talent in the region. And we also have programs to develop and strengthen sources of entrepreneurial uh, finance. In, in the area of business development, uh, this is an area where, where the bank has worked for a very long time, uh, especially on, on small and medium enterprise uh, programs, but also uh, a lot of work uh, has been done here in the way of clusters and value chains and innovation systems. Uh, we have many programs uh, throughout Brazil and Argentina and Chile uh, and several also in Central America and, and in the Caribbean countries. And uh, a lot of what we do here is working on issues of internationalization of SMEs, working on issues of export promotion, improved access to information uh, for the design and monitoring and evaluation uh, of these policies. And we also, and, and it's, it's still a very critical area of support in, in Latin America, is to work on the issue of institutions and environment. Uh, there is, is still a, a great deal that we have to do in terms of promoting a climate that favors innovation and competitiveness. Uh, we need to strengthen institutions and knowledge networks, and we need to improve regulatory frameworks that will facilitate the creation and development of innovative companies. And we also need to facilitate public and private dialogue. Uh, the area of broadband, uh, which I put here, is, is something uh, quite new, actually, in the bank, and we're currently developing uh, an initiative and, and the reason we have put broadband here with competitiveness innovation is because to us it is a platform and, and one of the key platforms uh, in today's uh, very informatic uh, age uh, to uh, support innovation, uh, whether it's in the services sector, whether it's in the health sector, education sector, or uh, in the SME sector. And so uh, we are taking a holistic approach to broadband development focused on the development of public policies and strategic regulations, a focus on the deployment of infrastructure through public-private partnerships, uh, as well as capacity building in the public and private sectors, and the development of innovative services uh, and applications. And uh, basically, to, to complete my presentation, uh, I just want to mention that some of the, the challenges uh, that we find um, in, in our programs. And I think the, the center, the core challenge, I would say, that we still face in Latin America is the issue of building institutions, building capacity uh, among uh, institutions in the public and in the private sector uh, so that they are able to develop, implement, and also evaluate uh, policies that support competitiveness uh, and innovation. It, we like to think that what we offer at the bank is not only the finance, but really the possibility of, uh, of accompanying uh, the countries and the governments of our region uh, to learn uh, about the des how do you design policies, uh, to share uh, in some of these learnings, uh, and to learn by doing. 
Uh, we, we strongly believe that uh, there's a great deal uh, still to do also in, in terms of bringing the point of view of the enterprise sector in, to, the, to the public policies uh, that are being uh, implemented uh, throughout the region. Um, just to, to give you an example, uh, in, in Peru, uh, we supported the, the creation and strengthening of INSEEF, uh, which is an innovation agency. And I think uh, when we first started this program, there were basically very little knowledge in the country about how you operate an innovation agency, what kinds of incentives you have to give to the private sector. Uh, and today we're uh, closing you know, a third uh, loan operation with with, uh, with Peru uh, to support uh, a very active uh, innovation, innovation policy. Uh, we are currently working in, in most of the countries of Latin America. Uh, as you can see here, they have different kinds of emphases. We have about uh, 70 uh, different kinds of projects also. And, uh, and just to, to conclude, I wanted to share with you a, a video from one of the programs that we have in, uh, in Uruguay. Do you guys still have time? It's, it's three minutes, so I, I can cut it. It's not a problem. Do it? Okay. Let's see if we can... Uh, well, thank you very much. But whenever you present about technology and innovation, technology doesn't work. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> It's a question for Flora. Uh, before, uh, let's say three years ago, the Chilean government tried to promote uh, clusters, innovation, and they follow and work very close, the Chilean government with your institution. But nowadays, we have a new government which believes more in, in entrepreneurship, promotion, but not much in the role of clusters and these uh, policies focused on certain industries. What is your view of the current situ situation and that type of change in the, government, in the governmental policies for the development of a country in class of policy? Good morning. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Uh, I, for those who might not have heard it, it has to do with uh, changes in uh, in Chilean policy in terms of cluster development, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, 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 you are correct. We, we, we worked very closely with Chile for many, many years. Uh, we had uh, extensive programs on technology and, and innovation uh, with, a, with a very strong cluster focus. And we also had a program on, um, on uh, local development or, or local development agencies uh, throughout Chile. Uh, 
the, I think that there have been some changes in policies. I think that uh, the new government is, is, is a little bit reluctant to continue to focus on clusters because it's too, too selective, let's say. There's too much of a, an impression that you might be uh, picking winners. But I think what, what does continue, I mean, I think the, the, the continuity in Chilean policy has to do with the focus on productivity which in the end is the big concern uh, for Chilean growth, is how do they increase productivity. And, and I think that it's just, uh, uh, they're implementing different kinds of mechanisms uh, to improve productivity. I think uh, the, they have developed a very strong council for competitiveness and innovation, and that continues to operate. They're creating a lot more emphasis nowadays on issues of entrepreneurship. Uh, and they have some very exciting programs. Uh, you may have heard of Startup Chile, uh, where they're trying to attract entrepreneurs to Chile. So I think there's, uh, there are differences in policy emphases, uh, but I think uh, they're both valid approaches. And uh, as, as far as I, under I understand, they, they continue to work on, on, uh, on uh, innovation uh, also at the local level. So, I think there have been some some refinements of policy, uh, but it hasn't been, I would say, that there's been a radical uh, change uh, in policies or that there has been a total break from the policies of the past either. One more question. That was like an answer from a different yes. One question here. This question is for Janovic of Devon. Uh, sort of a similar question, but about Rwanda, where I know you've been involved, and I think a number of people from TCI have been over the years, so I know the president has been thinking about competitiveness. So how is it working with this, uh, working on the missing middle so far, and what do you see as the challenges ahead? And I also just want to ask, um, I know in the World Bank, when you first came, there was maybe about 100 people that were willing to use the word cluster. Has that changed at all since you've been there? And, and I just want to encourage you, um, there's many more than 100 people here, and it's okay with all of them if you use that word. So <laughs> we're among friends. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the, uh, to answer the uh, second question, first, we are up to about 5,000, so <laughs> we're, we're making headway. Um, uh, look, the, the, and, and I mentioned it earlier, I think the uh, fighting of Washington consensus bias right, has been a huge deal in development um, organizations. So I think things have changed. And I think the pragmatic ones amongst us right, are open now to, um, to debating the issues in, in, a, in a much broader sense. And the fact of the matter is that over the past four years, especially since the, you know, the crisis evolved in 2007 and 2008, um, the evidence is there. I mean, you look at the Singapore's of the world and, and, and South Korea and Malaysia, uh, what's happening in, uh, in Europe and so on. Um, the Washington consensus guys are running out of arguments, <laughs> I would say. Um, and so that, there has been, in fact, a positive tilt, right? um, even within the, uh, the bank. Uh, my new president has come in, um, and when he first heard about our practice competitive industry, um, he said, isn't that about clusters? So I said, oh, that's fantastic, so you get it. Right. Um, so I think we're on a, on, a, on a good trajectory of that. On the Rwanda thing, um, at Rwanda, um, I met uh, President Kagame, uh, actually, and um, they're making some really interesting uh, inroads in uh, uh, industry level uh, interventions, whether it's in horticulture, tourism, and so on. So I, I see a, a positive trajectory. Um, at the same time, I, I want you know, um, to share with you that a number of our client countries are asking the, uh, you know, I, I think they asking questions incorrectly sometimes. You know, saying, you know, we want to be a Singapore, right? That frankly, is a, is a tough one for us to explain that, look, there are different contexts in the case of Singapore and in South Korea. It is not a cut and paste job, right? And that the context is, is different and you've got to adapt it that would make sense to your own environment. 
Singapore is an entrepreneur for facility, Rwanda is landlocked, you know, there, there is no such thing in the current case, you know, um, effort. But I think they're asking, uh, at the same time, they are looking towards new and innovative ways uh, towards um, addressing the, you know, the signal. Well, I have been informed that uh, Michael Porter is already connected. So thank you very much for our, to our speakers for their very insightful uh, presentations and all of you for your attention. Uh, let's exchange places. Um, thank you very much. in some ways continuing the conversation that we just had uh, about how do you make these ideas of competitiveness and clusters and innovation uh, work. I'm uh, extremely pleased and honored uh, to hopefully hearing me on the other side of uh, the Atlantic, the Bishop William Lawrence Professor uh, Michael E. Potter, who's with us on video from Boston. So I hope you can see us and hear us. Okay, so we need to screw we need to have a little bit more volume for <laughs> the audience here to be uh, uh, hearing you as well. Uh, well, Michael, I think you, you would deserve, of course, uh, um, that I read out your CV and all the accomplishments. All of the people here in the room not only know you, but have worked uh, with the ideas that you have developed over the last uh, decades uh, very intensively. Um, we had a session this morning uh, that was called Pioneers of cluster mobilization. And there was one sequence in that session that I thought uh, is maybe as good as uh, reading about your, your accomplishments in different fields. Uh, it was one from one of our good friends, uh, Professor Anthony Sevira from Catalonia. He talked about his experience in the 90s, how he looked at the industry and he said, you know, I knew all the details about the industrial fabric of Catalonia. But then I read Michael Porter's books. I talked to him through a common friend, uh, Eduardo Valerín, who's unfortunately not with us anymore. Um, and what that gave me is it gave me a structure to understand and put together all these individual complex questions of how the industry looks like. And with that understanding, I was able to move to action, to really have an impact, uh, to change the way that that regional economy has, has been moving forward. And maybe I think that's a very uh, fitting explanation of what your work has done uh, for this field, certainly on clusters and competitiveness. Now, when we talk about this session, um, of course, we, would, uh, uh, we, we could have uh, just had a, a presentation by you, and I know it would have been uh, great and inspiring. Uh, but then I saw one of the recent books about your work, uh, uh, which is called Understanding Michael Porter uh, by John McGrath, about uh, your work on strategy. And I thought maybe what we'll do here today is we have a conversation instead of a presentation to really help people understand a little bit more how has your thinking evolved on clusters and competitiveness, where is it heading, uh, what are the things that are today on your mind um, as, as, as you look at the world and uh, discuss with many leaders issues of competitiveness and clusters. So let me try to kick it off. Uh, uh, certainly my first uh, interaction with your work, and I think that's true for many of us uh, that went to a business school uh, or you know, uh, study business administration, was uh, your books on competitive uh, uh, strategy on, on competitive advantages, on company strategy, on industry analysis. You then moved in 1990 uh, to the competitive advantage of nations and your work on competitiveness and with a more economic policy focus. Um, take us a little bit on the journey. What got you interested in this completely new field after you just kind of defined the field of strategy, which is already, you know, uh, usually enough for one academic to do in his lifetime? What got you interested in this new set of issues? Well, first of all, Christian, I want to say how pleased I am to be able to interact with all of you today. If I wasn't I didn't have another job, I would be there. Uh, I, I'd be there because of TCI, because of the the people that are there, because of what you all do, which is which, what I care so deeply about. And I, I would also uh, be there because of the Basque country and because of the tremendous relationship we've had. We may want to talk about that later. 
And I, I, I most of all would want to be there because of you, Christian uh, Kedels, who have been really fundamental to my work over the last uh, 15 years and uh, an incredible partner and uh, somebody I'm very proud of. So I, it's just a pleasure to be involved in this process uh, and in this dialogue. And uh, again, I just wish I could be there uh, in person. Um, you know, the work I did on companies um, started out with really industry structure, the value chain, and trying to understand competitive advantage and, and kind of the roots of, 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 of sustainable success. Um, there's sort of an intermediate step that was a book that I did. It was a, it was a collection of articles on globalization and global strategy. And we were just starting to work out uh, the kind of analytics of what is global strategy. And of course, that started involving the issue of location. How should firms spread activities in the value chain uh, to different parts of the world? And uh, there was a book called Competition in Global Industries that uh, I, uh, I, ch I, I, I was the leader of a group of faculty who were kind of tackling that question um, you know, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the 80s. Um, but, you know, and then I started to confront the issue of location. And uh, the more I kind of looked uh, at location around the world, the more that I started seeing that their location seemed to matter uh, for competitive success because you saw multiple companies in the same field succeeding in the same location. And that was not an accident. You know, that happened over and over and over again. And so I got very fascinated with that question. And then, then soon after that, I was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to a presidential commission on U.S. competitiveness. That's the last time in this country we ever really had a national discussion about competitiveness. That was because of Japan and the emerging threat it was perceived of Japan to the American economy. And all those things came together and I, and I, and I undertook this long project, which uh, was, of course, the Competitive Advantage of Nations book. Um, and um, I think what's critical is that, that, you know, we never stopped working on companies uh, but we started adding another set of dimensions about the business environment. And, and of course, the whole notion of clusters emerge from that body of work. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, that what, what really characterizes the, the trajectory I've been on versus much work uh, on competitiveness is I really come from the bottoms up, uh, looking deeply at companies and how they compete. Uh, rather than more from the top down, uh, thinking more about the macro policy environment and then sort of saying, okay, now what, now what does that mean for companies? And I, and I think that's hopefully shed some, some new light on the question. Hey, thank you. I think this, uh, this reflects actually a lot on, on the discussion that we just had. Uh, Dimitri Devon from the World Bank, who you know very well, was commenting on the fight well, yeah. with, the, with the Washington consensus. And uh, you know, I think that is exactly kind of adding uh, what, what, what he called the missing middle. Uh, the, the companies, the industries that you need to understand if you want to drive um, economic development. I, I, also, just uh, from what you said, I think what is very interesting is that you make this connection between work on global strategy and globalization and location. Uh, because what we see in many of our discussions here is that there was a phase when clusters were perceived to, you know, just look at the local. And we're now moving to a stage where we, where we see much more also the practical world, less local within the global context. And it, it seems that your work that was exactly where you were coming from, um, understanding the role of location in the, in, the, in the global perspective. Now, one of the issues that is, that is very close to many people's minds here is the role of regions. Uh, and you know, not the least, I think, of our hosts here in the Basque region, um, that they think a lot about what, the re what, what, what regions can do. Your, your, your book in, in 1990 was called The Competitive Advantage of Nations. Uh, you've worked a lot on uh, what that means for regions. In recent years, you had the, 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 the article, Economic Performance of Regions. How has your, has your thinking of, changed over time, or has the focus changed over time? How do you look at the role that different levels of geography play? Well, you know, it, it's been, a, again, a natural evolution. I think, I think we all sort of, uh, you know, grew up with the idea of that the nation was the fundamental unit uh, because it so shapes the identity of any, uh, of any, of any citizen. Uh, and uh, so we talk about Japan or Germany or, or the United States. And, uh, and I, think, I think it was a natural place to start for me as I was kind of trying to understand uh, the, how location mattered. But... Uh, it became very clear quite soon uh, after the publication of the Competitive Edge of Nations that the same ideas could be applied at the subnational level. 
In fact, the Basque Country, one of the first places that actually started, we started working with on these ideas, as well as Catalonia and Minister Sabira, were not nations. You know, they were subnational regions with very distinct economic circumstances, even though they were all both part of Spain. So it became very clear that, and over time, it became even more clear that there are really three, at least three levels at which you can think about competitiveness, and they all matter. And the more we know about competitiveness, the more we now know that we have to kind of create activity and ideally integration across those levels. So the core level, I believe, of competitiveness, the kind of atomic unit of competitiveness actually is the region. Now, how we define a region and how big that is, you know, is a complicated question we can talk about. I don't want to be an academic, but there's a lot of practical questions about how big a region is. And we, you know, metropolitan areas can be seen as regions, but we believe that's where most of the action is, because most of the key assets that really drive productivity in a location are actually assets that are specific to that region. The roads there, the universities there, the people that are living there with certain sets of skills, the location of companies in a particular field there. So really the core unit is the region. Nations are important, particularly, you know, the smaller the nation, the more the relative impact of the nation versus the region. Even in the United States, nations matter because they set certain framework policies that apply across all regions. And then what we came to learn later, which came out of some work I did in Central America and ultimately spread to other locations, is that we also have to worry about what we call the neighborhood. The neighborhood is the countries next door. And the nature of the economic integration and coordination with neighboring countries also has a profound effect on productivity and competitiveness and growth, because your neighbors, due to proximity and often due to language and accessibility and so forth, are actually your most natural trading and investment partners. And so therefore it's most easy to, in a sense, trade and interconnect with your neighbors. And so, and good economic policy, you know, often has to start with national policy because ultimately governments sort of report up to the national level, but ultimately good competitiveness policies have to really drive down to the subnational region and involve also some consideration of coordination with the neighbors. I mean, I believe increasingly that the real, what we've really got to do is get much more economic focus and policy and energy down at the regional level. And some of the most successful countries are the countries that for a variety of reasons have this very much this decentralization, this regional focus. And some countries that have made huge strides in competitiveness, like Indonesia, for example, have done so partly because they took all the decision rights out of the national capital and kind of drove a lot of activity down to the regional level. This is, of course, one of the heatedly debated issues right here in Spain. I mean, both of the election coming up in the Basque Country, the election coming up in Catalonia, where these issues are quite central. What's the relationship between these regions and Spain, but also the European Union, a little bit more broadly? Now, one of the things that is conceptually and in practice very closely connected, of course, to the regional level, to the subnational regional level, are clusters. Um, I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about how you saw your work, your research, your thinking on clusters and cluster analysis uh, evolve since maybe the 1990 book. Uh, it was interesting in the session this morning, uh, we had also uh, uh, John Asua, uh, who was uh, at the time here, here uh, in the government in the Basque country, and he talked about um, the, 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 the emergence of, of new ways to really identify and describe clusters and look at their impact over time, tools that did not necessarily exist when uh, you and he kind of started out doing some work here in the Basque Country uh, about 20, 25 years ago. How, how has the work evolved over time in your perspective? Well, uh, I mean, it certainly has evolved. And uh, I mean, I, I think that, first of all, uh, the, the, this whole idea of a cluster is, 
you know is a is an evolution of ideas were for which there are long historical roots i mean i think we've long understood this phenomena of agglomeration and the industrial districts work and professor becatini's work and and marshall and others there's this kind of kind of a there's kind of some work on clusters historically but 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 what was lacking in in a lot of the earlier work on clusters was sort of the granularity of being able to understand uh the phenomena of clusters from a company perspective and and you needed a rich understanding of companies and how they competed and 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 the nature of how competitive advantage is 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 created to i think fully understand what a cluster was and how it really worked and uh so that's that's kind of what i i, I really brought uh to, to the fore um uh, and 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 that that those uh outlines were really uh, you know developed in competitive advantage of nations but but over time we started to get deeper and deeper and deeper tools and, and, and concepts for looking at the cluster, how to map the cluster, how to draw boundaries of clusters. Uh, one of the first uh, steps was to recognize what we now call IFCs, or Institutions for Collaboration. We, we sort of discovered that there was all these institutions that were not companies, and they weren't universities, and they weren't uh, government entities, but they existed within clusters. Uh, they were trade associations, they were uh, you know, quality organizations, uh, there are various kinds of, of networks and, and sort of connective organizations, um, and we did we did some work on those and, and did some writing about those, and that's now part of I think our, the standard thinking about clusters is you've got to kind of understand these institutions. Um, and, and by the way, there's a ripe opportunity for more work there. Um, we uh, then ultimately started trying to quantify and make more rigorous. Uh, the uh, definition of clusters and the boundaries of clusters. Uh, early on, cluster definition was kind of, you know, kind of, you, sort of, you, you sort of defined it yourself. You know, it was kind of uh, bottoms up. Every every region sort of said, okay, these these are the clusters, and this is how we define them. We were very very focused on trying to get a, a consistent way of thinking about the the boundaries of clusters and the definition of clusters. Uh, and that work will go on for many years, but but we you know about a decade ago we created this cluster mapping project and started using statistical data on economic geography to actually empirically map the boundaries of clusters. And that work, uh, which Christian you know you've been deeply involved in, is evolving now to the next level. Uh, we're just about to issue uh, a new set of cluster definitions, which by the way are very closely related to the previous definitions. But there, these new definitions have been developed through a much more uh, sophisticated methodology with new data that we didn't have available, you know, eight or ten years ago. So, uh, so uh, I think we're now starting to put a quantitative, uh, 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 empirical foundation to studying clusters and their impact. And now that we've got good rigorous data on on clusters across economic geography, and by the way, this exists not just for America but for Canada. It's being developed for Mexico, and, and hopefully will spread globally. Uh, the European uh, Observatory Project. We have more and more quantitative data. Then we can start to more rigorously compare, uh, you know, how a cluster is doing uh, in this region, this region, and this region. And, and we're starting to be able to uh, uh, then uh, look at how clusters matter for performance. I mean, I think we all had a, I mean, I, I put forth kind of a, of a very power, I thought a very hopefully persuasive concept for why clusters mattered, but we really didn't have data in order to test that statistically. And I think that's one of the reasons that economists, have, you know, some, some sort of conventional academic economists have been a little skeptical about, about clusters. Now, of course, we have the first data uh, and there's the first several papers now, and we're showing really the profound impact of clusters on just about everything that matters in terms of economic performance, job growth, wages, uh, patenting and innovation, uh, new business formation, the longevity of new businesses. Uh, and there's a body of papers there that, that now are starting to provide the empirical foundation, and hopefully there'll be more of that. Um, and then I think that the kind of final thing that I would mention here is that as we as we look deeply at clusters and we have better data, we are now starting to understand better how clusters are related uh, and overlap. And, and again, this was always part of the theory, uh, but now we can actually uh, empirically see how co-location patterns overlap between uh, you know, chemicals and plastics or between 
uh, you know, knowledge creation and uh, analytical instruments. And we're starting to be able to understand now quantitatively how economies diversify. Uh, how economies move into new industries. And, and, and we can start to see that the probability of success of economic diversification uh, is profoundly affected by, uh, you know, the, the, the mix of clusters and which clusters you're trying to move into. So if you're a, uh, a region that is, uh, you know, uh, producing uh, automotive products, for example, um, it's much more likely that you'll be able to successfully economically diversify into, uh, you know, production technology, which is the uh, kind of factory automation equipment, um, which has highly high, high high interrelationships between the kind of skills that are necessary to make automobiles that you start to learn if you develop an automotive cluster. So I, I, we are seeing a day coming where we'll be able to quite rigorously um, uh, help uh, bring some light to this question of economic diversification. Economic diversification is one of the great unanswered questions in uh, competitiveness and development. We have ideas about how to think about it, but, but in terms of being able to be really uh, rigorous and data-driven about, uh, about it, we're, we're just starting to get there. And um, uh, yeah, there are many more things I could say about how the ideas on clusters continue to evolve, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleased now that we're having less pushback um, you know, many people thought that, you know, clusters was another way of saying industrial policy. And, you know, industrial policy was fundamentally about targeting specific industries. And, and, and everybody in this room knows that, that clusters are not about targeting. Clusters are about a natural fundamental process that goes on in any economic development process, which is that clusters form and, and, and upgrade if, if, if the environment allows them to. And, and all clusters are good. And the implication is not targeting. The implication is to create a, a structure so that, so that clusters can actually form and, 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 and be more uh, productive. And uh, I think we're starting to get over that old, tired discussion. Uh, and now we're focusing on, well, OK, well, how do you actually do this? And what sorts of intervention are useful, and what kinds of organizations and institutions and processes are really are really necessary? I think I think that's kind of in my in my view now. We a lot of the questions of what to do in economic policy have become much 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 clearer. We kind of know sort of what to do. We know it's context specific. I heard Mr. Devon say that it's absolutely context specific. What they did in Singapore is not you know what you need to do in some different circumstance. Uh, but we now kind of have the tools to figure out sort of what needs to be done, what are some of the key policies that we have to put in place, what are the things we have to uh, kind of get accomplished. But I think the great holy grail now that we spend a lot of time on here is how do we actually get it done? How do we get it done? And that's a, that's a process of how government works. That's a process of how public and private people actually work together. Uh, it's how to get things done. It's fundamentally an organizational problem. It's, it, and it's a problem of, of creating a common direction and a common vision. And I think we're, uh, what, what we spend a lot of time on here working on now is, you know, how do we think about that systematically? Now that we kind of understand the, the what, you know, how do we understand the how? I think that, that connects uh, a lot to the discussion we just had. We did, you know, both uh, Flora Painter and uh, uh, Devin uh, talked about uh, all, both at the third element, you know, you, Flora, talked about capacity as being absolutely critical. Then you talked about implementation as, as really what, what needs to come, um, come to the fore. Want to make a, a quick comment, Devin? Uh, uh, well, I actually have a, um, a question for, uh, for Michael. Michael, um, great to be speaking uh, to you from here. Um, and the, many of you recognize, you know, uh, many of us, sorry, recognize you as being the, uh, the godfather of a lot of what is being uh, discussed. And I'm, I mean it in the, in the good way, not, not the, <laughs> um, not the, the dead horse and the, uh, on your bed. But the, um, so carrying on, and I, I recall having this conversation with you while riding with you to the, uh, the airport when you were in Washington recently. And, and I just want to pursue this, uh, this line of inquiry. Uh, coming from the bank, we, we see real problems, and as I mentioned in my, um, uh, uh, in my talk earlier uh, today, 
we face a real problem of capture, right? When we're trying to, uh, to push the notion of clusters or, or growth poles or, uh, or even in the context of, you know, setting up SCCs uh, and so on. Um, and I think it would be really great to get your thoughts on how you dealt with that, um, with that problem over the past you know, uh, 20 years of, uh, of dealing with you know, heads of state, uh, governments, and, and trying to get them to see um, and see the notion of clusters, um, uh, industries, and so on. Um, so help us out down here. How, how do we address that particular issue? And this may be really relevant to a number of the clients in the bank group and, uh, and certainly other multilateral uh, agencies where we need to be careful about um, uh, cronyism and, and, uh, and, and capture of, uh, of industries? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, and um, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the things I've said are, are hopefully, um, uh, you know, sort of precursors anyway to talking about the question. Um, we, um, uh, I, I think what, one of the things that, that we've always said uh, that is kind of fundamental to cluster thinking is that, uh, which I said a minute ago, which is all clusters are good. That there, there is because the fundamental phenomena here is that the agglomeration and the co-location, and 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 often then the collaboration in certain respects. Um, enables productivity and productivity growth and new business formation and and uh, and that is good in any field of the economy so I, I think we have to start out by getting away from the idea that first of all that there there's some uh, clusters that are good and some clusters that are bad and we should understand the good ones and help them and the bad ones we can ignore or worse okay that that's point number one Point number two, I think we have to get away from the notion that clusters have anything to do with intervening in competition. That is, that the cluster concept implies the need for subsidy, that it implies the need for uh, protective, protective tariffs, that it implies the need for any really intervention in the market process. Um, and we've got to understand that the fundamental idea of clusters is raising the bar of competition. It's not intervening in the competitive process, it's raising the bar. And raising the bar is fundamentally about improving the asset base, the skill base, um, the, uh, the, less, the, the intrusiveness of the regulatory environment, um, uh, and uh, not about uh, you know, subsidy or intervention or sort of tilting, uh, tilting the world you know, in, in favor of a particular location. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always thought it very ironic that the Krugman work, you know, uh, was really all about intervening in competition uh, uh, in order to favor one location gaining in the economies of scale, uh, which is a deeply flawed idea. I mean, that got us onto a horrendously bad track in terms of thinking about economic policy. We, don't, we know that doesn't work very well. So, so if, we, if we have those two ideas, then I think the next idea we have to get across is the idea that that cluster development isn't about spending large amounts of money. Um, uh, you know, there's an instinctive uh, understanding or belief on the part of many government folks that I talk to that if you're going to do clusters, that means you've got to have a big checkbook, and uh, the and so that you can you know write checks to to spend lots of money to do things. And uh, you know, again, the basic concept and the work we do suggests no, this isn't about writing big checks. This isn't about spending lots of money. This is about um, actually, uh, just you know, fixing things and constraints in the environment. And yes, there may need to be some money for certain kinds of, uh, you know, technology assets or certain kinds of of, of training programs or, or university programs. But but ultimately, the cluster concept is is really about um, uh, uh, not about about money, but it's it's really about uh, you know setting setting better policies, having better collaboration getting the existing entities more effective because they're understanding better the role they play in, in, in working with other entities or seating uh, sophisticated people to other entities. So uh, now in order to avoid the sort of capture phenomena, I think the, 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 the best, you know, the best defense often is just objective data. And, and rather than have it be a matter of opinion, you know, 
what clusters are emerging or what clusters uh, we really ought to support, uh, the more we can actually have real data, the more we can actually provide some analytical rigor to uh, you know, really diagnosing the, the state of a given cluster, the more we get uh, insulate ourselves a little bit from uh, this this idea that they're cronies of the government and and they use this cluster idea as simply a way of getting subsidies and support, you know, and and of course the, that that's the big nightmare that I've been living with now for 20 years, and that is that the whole idea gets captured for a fundamentally different purpose uh, than it was ultimately designed, you know, to try to reveal and 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 help understand, and and of course that happens, you know, all over the world, and. Uh, um, and, uh, and and we so what we have to do is we have to understand what what it's what it, it's all about. And um, uh, I guess one final point I'd make is that that cluster development doesn't work uh, very often if it's heavily uh, you know driven by government. Um, it, it we really needs to see that as a bottoms up process in which government is a participant. Government does things that help or hurt. Uh, but ultimately, it's a, a bottoms-up process where the private sector uh, must take the lead. And, and the more you get multiple people in the private sector together, the more you start having checks and balances that guard against kind of the, uh, you know, the kind of distortion or, 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 or subsidies that get introduced when, when, again, when there's cronyism or when a certain powerful industry sort of uses this as a way of capturing re more resources in the society. Um, so I don't know if I've, I've answered that question. It's really a hard question, uh, but but once again, I think I think the people in this room care about something that you know many academics don't care about, and that is, you know, how does things happen in the real world? You know, and how do you? Uh, and and I think the, the 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 cluster concept is is a really a descriptive concept with an analytical underpinning that kind of explains why it what it is and why it happens. But then the question is, what do you do about it uh, in the real world? That becomes a very, very complicated question, which is which is riddled with issues like capture and distortion and misunderstanding and politics. And um, and, and I think for the World Bank, uh, that that's an issue in every single country in which you work. You know, how can we actually make our our work uh, objective and 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 based on kind of the realities of development and and, and inoculate ourselves from all the the, the, the biases and, 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 and distortions that get introduced because of politics, because of uh, you know friends of the president, because of market power, where a couple of companies really have a tremendous amount of market power. Uh, you know, our, our challenge as, as practitioners here is to is to navigate across both understanding how the world works and these key concepts, but also uh, knowing how. Uh, how to intervene, how not to intervene, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, let me stop there because, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a question that's animating a lot of my attention right now. And I think it's, uh, as, you, as you very rightly said, Mike, I think this is an issue that all of us here in the room, all in the TCI network, are deeply concerned about. How, we, how do we take these ideas um, into action? Um, how do we make sure that we avoid uh, the real danger there is. Somebody this morning said, you know, the big problem is not that if a new government comes in that they change the name of the cluster program. The bigger danger is that they keep the name cluster program, but they institute something that's very different from the underlying idea. And I think that is uh, that is all, only all, uh, too true. Now I know we're we're starting to get to the end uh, end of, of our time here. Uh, what I would love to do is, uh, a lot of people don't uh, know about the breadth of your work in other fields as well, and it's all connected to the idea of competition, uh, but I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about some of the other efforts that you are engaged in, other, some of the other topics that you are currently working on, and uh, we'll continue to work on for the next uh, few years. Well, thank you, Christian. I'd be happy to. Uh, I think the first thing I would mention is um, that we are deeply focused on this topic of economic development, um, and um, about a decade ago, we created a course at Harvard. I never really taught a course on economic development. I was teaching strategy, company strategy, and we developed a course which is called MOC, Microeconomics of Competitiveness. Some of you may have heard of it, and uh, we decided that we would make that course not just a course at Harvard, but we would make it a course 
sort of a platform that many schools in many countries could participate in and we have now over the years built up a a set of affiliated universities around the world i think we 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 hit 102 uh this year uh we have universities from every continent and um, it's kind of a collaboration of of schools and faculty all of whom care a lot about economic development and use this course and the curriculum that we developed as sort of a platform for uh, engaging students and and, and, and in many cases, practitioners on this issue. So I'm still you know, deeply involved in, in building out the MOC course and the network. And, and anybody in this room uh, that doesn't have an MOC affiliated university in your country, we'd love to have, we'd love to talk to you. You know, we'd love to have the good universities in every country teaching about these core ideas because the more that we have bright young people uh, understanding the concepts and the way of looking at the world and understanding the reality of international competition, the better things will go. And and the Basque Country is a great example. You know, John Asua and, and his colleagues there at Orchestra and in the Basque Country have been teaching MOC to leading Basque, you know, uh, citizens and young people now for many years. And that means there's really a kind of a common understanding of competitiveness in the Basque country. There's a kind of a common understanding of the idea of clusters and what they are and what they aren't. And, 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 and that's been enormously uh, influential in, in the ability of Basque country to perform so well. We're very proud of John. We're very proud of the Basque. What an amazing story, you know, despite a lot of complexity in terms of, you know, the, the politics in Spain and ETA and all this kind of stuff, we have an economy that's, just been remarkably, uh, uh, remarkably dynamic. Uh, I think because there's been a clear, common understanding of what it takes to succeed. And uh, so uh, the MOC though leads to one thing I wanted to say, which is we've now been teaching MOC for about 10 years. And so there's another book uh, about competitiveness that is uh, being written as we speak. And uh, how long it takes is, is, is always a imponderable for me because I'm a little bit slow. But um, but but, you know, it's going to try to develop these other dimensions that have been uh, 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 the result of the 20 years of work that we've been doing since then. And um, and some of the work that Christian, you've been involved in and, and many other people in this room. So there's another book on competitiveness. We're not we're not done there. But now related to that, Harvard Business School has taken on a major initiative of the school on U.S. competitiveness. Uh, the U.S. economy is facing some really severe uh, discontinuities the, uh, that have developed. Uh, uh, we have some serious problems here in the U.S. economy, and uh, the school has taken this on. We've done a large body of work on U.S. competitiveness, um, and that's been the result. That's led to a lot of articles, uh, surveys, uh, um, and uh, and and we are and I am co-leading that effort with Jan Rifkin, who leads our strategy group here at Harvard, and. Uh, we're, we're very excited about uh, how to move practice in America and how to use uh, the business community, how to mobilize the business community to get deeply engaged in the issue of competitiveness. And, and I think there's some useful learning that's coming out of this project that, that hopefully we, we, we can communicate. And we would welcome, we share what we're doing with any school in the world or any organization in the world that wants to do the same kind of work on, on their economy that we're doing on the U.S. economy. Uh, we'd be happy to share that. Uh, two other things I'd mention. Um, I about a decade ago I started working on healthcare, uh, healthcare delivery, uh, how we could change the way healthcare is delivered to dramatically improve the value. Uh, there's a book on that. There's a whole body of work on that now that I'm I'm very proud of. So I'm working a lot on healthcare systems and working with hospitals and hospital systems and and physicians and and and, and other healthcare professionals on you know how do we think about uh, changing the way we do healthcare to drive value uh, using kind of value principles in in that field. And uh, and then the final thing I'd mention. Uh, is the work uh, on uh, what we call creating shared value. Um, you know, if you kind of go from company strategy, which is where I started, to location and economic development, uh, uh, and now I, well, there's kind of a feedback loop, which is, okay, now that we understand, you know, kind of what creates prosperity and how we make things better for citizens, now what is the role of business in that? And, and the work on shared value talks about how we can kind of extend our thinking about 
economic value creation to uh, get companies much more engaged in creating social value at the same time as they're creating economic value. And uh, that article, Creating Shared Value, is something that uh, has led to a, a quite a, a global dialogue. And, and, I, and I, I, I speak about that with businesses you know, all over the world. And we have to re-energize business to be seen as a really positive force in society. And I think we in business have sort of lost our way with CSR programs and, and, and so forth. And, and so this work on shared value is an attempt to kind of get business engaged in the process of driving community and, and national improvement without the idea that this is charity or patriotism. You know, what, what, what is in our interest in business? What can we really affect? How can we turn solutions to societal problems into economic models? The, the, the whole body of work on that. So you can see all these pieces sort of ultimately come together and, and fit together. Um, and uh, But uh, it's a very exciting uh, a time for me personally. And uh, again, I feel so at home, even though I'm in Boston, I feel so at home in that meeting because of what all of you do and what you care about. Uh, and the fact that you're out, you're actually trying to change things on the ground. Uh, and that's what really matters. Uh, and uh, so uh, I look forward to, you know, hopefully next time I'll be there in person. And I look forward to this dialogue continuing for many years to come. I also look forward to uh, the continued work with, with Christian and with Mr. Devin and with many of others of you, uh, you know, as we, as we take this forward. Thank you very much, Mike. We would love to have you at the party tonight, um, uh, which, will, which will happen only in a few hours from now. Now, one thing uh, really hasn't changed with you. Uh, you talked a lot about how things evolved over time, your energy and enthusiasm uh, about the things that you work on. And I think that's an inspiration to all of us uh, uh, in this area. So thank you very much. Uh, goodbye to Boston. Have a good day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Michael talked about uh, MOC and about our relationship to the Basque country, and uh, it's my real pleasure now to, to ask uh, Minister Unda uh, uh, to join us here to close uh, the session. He was actually in Boston when we um, presented the new Basque case uh, to, our, uh, to our group of, of, of Harvard uh, students discussing with them this experience and how, how it has uh, evolved over time. So, Minister Unda, um, please join us. La globalización es un término acuñado 
a principios de los años 80, hace ya casi 30 años, pero que añade a nuestro quehacer diario un factor de dificultad e incertidumbre. En los últimos años se han ido discutiendo en diferentes foros sobre las consecuencias de esta desaparición de fronteras en todos los ámbitos, así como sus excesos y virtudes. Independientemente de todo este debate, sobre el que podríamos seguir eternamente, creo que debemos poner la atención en sus efectos. La globalización provoca una consecuencia que a estas alturas debemos de aceptar como prácticamente irreversible. Nuestras empresas compiten y van a tener que seguir haciéndolo en el mercado mundial. Nuestros productos no tienen fronteras y lo mismo ocurre con otros países. La crisis no ha hecho sino acelerar este proceso iniciado hace tiempo. Haciendo necesario más que nunca que todos trabajemos en pos de la mejora de la competitividad de nuestras empresas. En definitiva, en pos de la mejora continua de nuestro tejido industrial. A lo largo de estos días han compartido mesa diferentes expertos que han debatido sobre las circunstancias provocadas. Se ha debatido sobre el modelo al equipo. Se ha puesto de relieve cómo es o debe ser la competitividad en diferentes ámbitos territoriales adentrándose en el caso de Euskadi, País Vasco, España. La última intervención, la hemos oído, la hacía el profesor Michael Porter y nos ha explicado algunas de sus conclusiones más importantes sobre esta materia. De todas las intervenciones se han obtenido importantes conclusiones que quedarán recogidas. Yo quiero poner de relieve la región de Euskadi, País Vasco. Quiero hacer un breve resumen de nuestras circunstancias, aunque seguro que ya les han dado detalles de ello. Euskadi, frente a otros países, es una comunidad donde el sector industrial tiene todavía un peso importante. En 2010 representaba el 24,5% del GDP, del PIB, frente a un 16,1% en España y un 18,7% en la Unión Europea de 2017. Nuestros sectores productivos constituyen una fortaleza que sirve de garante de nuestro bienestar. Nuestra industria ha sabido crecer y adaptarse en un mercado cambiante y altamente competitivo innovando, incorporando nuevas tecnologías a sus productos, lo que ha permitido adaptarse a un mercado cada vez más exigente. Esta estrategia de innovación y diversificación inteligente ha permitido el fortalecimiento y mantenimiento de un sector industrial que de otra manera hubiera estado condenado a su paulatina desaparición. Muchos han sido los agentes que han contribuido a ello, asociaciones clases en primer lugar, centros tecnológicos o la propia administración que siempre ha apostado por el mantenimiento de una política industrial, siendo la estabilidad en las actuaciones de la administración, de la administración del gobierno vasco en materia industrial también un elemento a destacar. Como ya sabrán, y sé que han conocido algunos de ellos, en los que contamos con 11 clases prioritarios y con 11 preclastes, que se encuentran en una fase muy preliminar. Nuestros clústeres y todos los agentes a lo largo de estos años de funcionamiento se han marcado planes, objetivos, se han implicado en la innovación y la tecnología, además de en la internacionalización. Y el propio gobierno vasco está absolutamente implicado. Al año nos reunimos en un observatorio de coyuntura industrial y analizamos los datos de cada sector, escuchamos sus necesidades. Esta, esa era una estructura necesaria y lo sigue siendo. Euskadi está formado de pequeñas y medianas empresas que su tamaño les dificulta para llegar a algunos de los ámbitos de esta manera, organizados y cooperando, están alcanzando objetivos imposibles. Y lo más importante aún, están logrando que todos los sectores, de una manera más o menos positiva, sigan con índices de producción importantes, que se mantengan. Ellos mismos son conscientes de esta necesidad y siguen haciendo un gran trabajo sector de máquina herramienta, el año pasado aunaba dos grandes asociaciones, Asociación de Fabricantes de Máquina Herramienta y de Exportadores y Accesorios y Componentes, dando lugar a un único clúster. Creo que esta fusión era necesaria para ganar en competitividad, en un momento económico como el que estamos atravesando. Hace unos días se constituía el preclúster del sector ferroviario, el de industrias de la lengua. Estamos todos juntos trabajando en esta línea, aunando esfuerzos, creando, progresando. El modelo vasco de clústeres se estudia en todo el mundo como ejemplo de cómo afrontar las políticas relacionadas con la competitividad. Y en concreto, como hoy lo hemos podido comprobar, el motivo de estudio en la Harvard Business School, donde 
el profesor Mike Reporte, a quien acabamos de escuchar, es considerado el máximo experto en competitividad y creador del concepto, del concepto de clase. Y como les digo, seguimos avanzando. El año pasado pusimos en marcha la iniciativa Intercluster, que permite las sinergias y puesta en marcha de proyectos de diferentes sectores. Y empieza a haber algunos primeros resultados en forma de proyectos. Quienes están implicados, insisto, implicados, comprometidos, están siendo activos y están valorando oportunidades de negocio. Este es nuestro modo de hacer, una forma de romper todas las barreras que nos impone la globalización, porque aunando esfuerzos somos capaces de ser más fuertes y competitivos, valorar debilidades y convertirlas en fortalezas. Esta forma de trabajo que nos permitió superar anteriores crisis y como ven, hemos innovado en esta forma de hacer y nos va a permitir también superar la crisis actual. Lo más importante, estamos implicados, comprometidos, todos, instituciones y empresas. Estoy convencido que de este encuentro hemos extraído nuevas lecciones, que nos seguirán aportando para la mejora de la competitividad de nuestras organizaciones. Se trata de una carrera de fondo por mejorar, por ganar la competitividad. Y por supuesto espero que ustedes también se vayan con grandes contribuciones que les hayan hecho los ponentes en nuestro país. Gracias a todos, gracias al TCI por la oportunidad que nos ha brindado de dar a conocer nuestro país, a nuestra gente, a nuestras empresas y a las asociaciones, clúster y centros tecnológicos y de nuevo gracias a los que han estado participando en esta reunión. Y para terminar quiero hacer una reflexión. Comentaba Cristian Cotle hace poco la importancia de la implicación, de la independencia, de la región. Y comentábamos que en estos tiempos turbulentos en los que todos tratamos de buscar la singularidad para ser más fuertes, como en estos momentos está ocurriendo, y usted lo decía, en Cataluña o en determinados lugares del mundo, en el que se busca la singularidad regional, yo quería poner una pregunta y una reflexión. Yo he estado trabajando 30 años en el mundo industrial. En los años 80, mediados de los 80, estuve en Japón. Estuve en una empresa, IHI, Shikawajima Head Industries, donde pude comprobar que la implicación, que el compromiso de las personas con la empresa, no con el país, sino con la empresa primero, era de tal calibre que hacía que la competitividad y la productividad hicieran ganar espacio. Años después, en los principios de los 90, estuve en Estados Unidos, Prata Blue, otra empresa modelo que gracias recientemente ha tenido un contrato francamente importante con una de nuestras empresas bandera del sector aeronáutico, como ITP. Y volví a encontrar otro factor, el factor del de compromiso. Personas analfabetas en el idioma inglés eran capaces de comprometerse para mejorar los procesos en las unidades de negocio que habían desarrollado, en las mini fábricas, que posteriormente así se llamaron. Y recientemente, en este nuevo trabajo al que ahora me dedico, Estuve en Alemania, estuve en BMW y comprobé otra vez una cosa y es el compromiso. Me dijeron, aquí hablamos en un solo idioma, hablamos en inglés, la empresa es lo primero, el compromiso es lo primero. Esa es la pregunta y ese es algo que me gustaría y la reflexión que me gustaría dejar después como para terminar esta sesión. Es el compromiso el factor de competitividad o es la identidad el factor de competitividad. Yo desde luego lo tengo muy claro, porque llevo treinta y tantos años por el mundo, pero el compromiso con un proyecto hace que cualquier grupo de empresas asociadas alrededor de un sistema tan bien organizado como el que aquí estamos teniendo con el sistema Cluster, que el profesor eh, Porter me dio el placer de ver cómo había pasado por los años 80, 90 y los 2000 a través de Euskadi, cómo el, el compromiso es el factor verdadero de competitividad. Y desde luego no es la identidad. Muchísimas gracias.